Economic growth is the way to measure success. And science and technology are its principal tools. That is the basis of modern thought. But I question it. The leading modern society, America, has produced the greatest surge in economic growth and material prosperity known to history. In the last 50 years, its gross domestic product has grown in constant inflation-adjusted dollars from $1.5 trillion to $5.9 trillion. American science and technology have achieved incredible innovations. And yet American society is deeply ill. Despite the current mood of discouragement, it must be remembered that Britain also has produced enormous material prosperity during the past 50 years. Relative to some other countries, her growth has not been impressive. But in absolute terms, gross domestic product, adjusted for inflation, has grown from 233 billion pounds to 600 billion pounds. So according to their own criteria, Western societies have succeeded beyond their dreams, but nonetheless, they're in deep trouble. Perhaps success cannot just be measured in economic terms. Perhaps national recovery is not just a product of economic growth. As America is the remaining superpower, and most of the world, more, more particularly Britain, seems to be turning to her as an example, I'll do likewise for the purpose of this lecture. Many Americans tend to believe that science can unravel all problems and that the whole world is some sort of puzzle that modern technology can work out. In other words, everything within nature can be analyzed and measured. Measurement, rather than wisdom, has become the preferred tool and this can lead to some serious mistakes. Here are just a few examples. Firstly, gross national product, known as GNP, is the official index of a nation's prosperity. But GNP only measures activity. Let me explain. If a calamity strikes, such as a hurricane or an earthquake, the immediate impact is growth in GNP as industry gears up to repair the damage. If there's a terrible epidemic, then GNP grows as new hospitals are built and more health workers are employed. If the amount of crime explodes, GNP grows as police forces are expanded and more prisons are constructed. Obviously, these are extreme examples. But GNP is not a measure of success nor of contentment. It is just a measure of activity, good or bad. American cities that are racked with crime, drug taking, alcoholism, suicide and family breakdown are, according to official figures, considered richer than many of the cities that have survived elsewhere in the world and which are still rich but in stability and contentment. This is relevant because most modern plans are judged by one standard only, their success in stimulating growth of GNP. My second example of measuring rather than understanding is the belief that a geographic space once populated, becomes a nation. In other words, the belief that you can bring together all sorts of people from all sorts of cultural and ethnic backgrounds into one area 
and thereby create a nation. In reality, a nation is something very different. It is the common culture, identity, and traditions of a nation which create its heritage and constitute a vital pillar of its stability. And that community of spirit takes a long time to develop. What greater proof do you need than to witness the violent resurgence of real nations which were submerged by force within artificial states like the Soviet Union, South Africa, Yugoslavia, and elsewhere throughout the world. Not to understand the difference between a populated space, a state, and a nation leads to policies which, when implemented, will create social breakdown, misery, and ethnic conflict. And that will be the case whatever the growth in GNP. My third example concerns geographical mobility. People, it is believed, should move to jobs rather than the reverse. But that's another example of deep ignorance of how human societies work. In a stable society, each member of a family has a role to play in the upbringing of the children, as have their friends. This is important not only for the children, but also for the older generations, who perform an important social function. Family friends constitute the public opinion with which children must cope. But if to find work the mother, father and children are forced to move, then the influences that help educate the children are transformed and the function of relatives is diminished. Often this function is transferred to schools which themselves are in deep moral crisis. The elders who have been left behind regroup in special, regroup in special retirement cities, often called sun cities, and the children become more anonymous within impersonal communities. Society begins to disaggregate. In particularly severe cases, when the families break down, the children seek alternative families and find surrogate relatives in urban gangs. Those who speak of reducing urban crime just by increasing the size of the police force confuse causes and symptoms. The police, no matter how good, can only control the symptoms. We create the disease by failing to understand the longer-term results of our own actions. I could describe an infinite number of such fundamental errors. The whole of our culture has been deformed by the modern method of thought. Let me try to propose some practical interpretations of all this. Firstly, when you assess new ideas, new plans, new political programs, and that sort of thing, go further than just attempting to analyze their effects on economic growth. You should also try to understand their longer term effects on the stability of society. Of course we need economic prosperity. But economic growth is valuable only if it contributes to the stability of a community. Surely this must be obvious. We've seen Britain's GNP nearly trouble, but at the same time, the streets have become unsafe. Houses now need to be made secure from burglary. The nation's institutions are no longer respected. The health and education systems have deteriorated, etc. And a very recent Gallup poll has shown that by an overwhelming majority, this is the opinion of the British people. Secondly, protect the nation. Do not let anyone transform it into a populated space. There will be ever-increasing pressures to open the gates. For example, Article 123 of the Maastricht Treaty states, and I quote, it shall aim to increase their geographical mobility within the community. Not just allow, 
allow mobility, but actually encourage it and even subsidize it. That's not the way to create Europe, but to destroy it. Outside Europe, population is exploding. And what is almost as bad, vast numbers of people are being uprooted. Tragically, again, we're the ones responsible. Ill-conceived international treaties like GATT, to which I'll turn, will have devastating consequences on the stability of society. The dual effects of exploding population and its systematic uprooting will lead to mass movements of people which will engulf those nations too weak to protect themselves. Thirdly, Europe is a necessity. Of course, it must be built on the basis of its constituent nations. People who confuse Europe with the United States of America forget that that great state was formed by immigration. Waves of immigrants reached a continent with only a very small indigenous population. To a large degree, they were starting from scratch. We're the opposite. Our populations have deep national roots. And that is a wonderful strength for so long as we do not attempt to shuffle people like a pack of cards. Europe must build on the strengths, cultures, and traditions of each nation. And each must retain the overwhelming majority of its existing power to govern itself. The powers that are transferred to the center must be principally those necessary to coordinate defense, diplomacy, environmental protection, and trade. That was what subsidiarity was supposed to be all about. Transferring to the center only those responsibilities that could not be assumed at national level. But last, subsidiarity has to some degree become a disguise. A disguise behind which lurks the centralizing lust of the European bureaucrat. To centralize would be a disaster. Vast groupings of international peoples governed by great central administrations, are not stable, as we've seen in the Soviet Union and to some degree in America. Brussels should not be either the Kremlin or Washington. Perhaps the major centralizing dynamic of the Maastricht Treaty is the proposal for a single currency. Its damage goes far beyond the economy. It will affect the whole basis of Europe. The best way to understand the effects of a single currency imposed uniformly on both rich and poor regions is to look at Italy and Germany. Uh, the economy of northern Italy is highly competitive, whereas that of the south is not. The south cannot, for example, adjust its currency to suit its economy. And so unemployment is great. The unemployed move northwards to seek work. To stem this migration, Italians subsidized investments in the south so as to create jobs there. And to do this, they formed institutions such as the Casa del Mezzogiorno and its successors, through which were channeled massive transfers of funds from the north to the south. The policy failed. Much of the investment went into useless, bureaucratic, mega-projects, and much was stolen or diverted for political purposes. Instead of generating employment, the subsidies generated corruption. And they also failed to stem migration, which continued to deracinate southern communities and to overpopulate and destabilize those in the north. This fiasco has caused a great resentment in the North. The result has been the formation of the Lombardy League, a political party whose platform is to separate the North from the remainder of Italy. Today it has become the leading party in its region. Similar leagues have now emerged in Tuscany and Venice. 
These subsidies and this migration of peoples, which I've just described, took place within the same nation. Nonetheless, it has aroused strong separatist passions. Imagine how much more resentment would be generated if they took place in entirely different nations, such as between Greece and Holland, or between Sicily and Germany. It must be obvious that the imposition of a single currency would unleash centrifugal forces that would tear Europe apart. But alas, our centralizing European bureaucrats are unable or unwilling to understand. A piece of advice. Campaign actively for the right to vote in a referendum on Maastricht. Then vote against it. And then campaign actively in favor of a strong Europe based on its constituent nations. My fourth and last point concerns GATT, which I mentioned earlier. It stands for the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Let me explain it, because it is typical of an international treaty, which looks good, seems as though it is just promoting world trade and economic growth, but which will inevitably cause immense harm. The GATT negotiations, as they affect agriculture, generally speaking, propose that nations would be prohibited from limiting the volume of imported agricultural products. The idea is that the inefficient agriculture of some countries would be forced either to modernize or to be replaced by the products of other nations, which already have implemented modern and efficient methods of agriculture. In other words, the idea is to force all nations of the world to become efficient in their agriculture or to phase it out and import products from countries that have already modernized their production. That sounds extremely logical. But we need to define and understand what is meant by efficient. It is generally accepted that large mechanized farms using modern scientific methods produce more food, more cheaply, for the benefit of the economy and of people throughout the world. But this conclusion is based on one-dimensional thinking. When people leave the land, they gravitate to the cities. If there are insufficient jobs available, then there will be increased unemployment. And if there is insufficient infrastructure, such as schools, houses and hospitals, then there will be a need for substantial new capital expenditure. Obviously, these costs must be taken into account when calculating the financial benefits of so-called intensive and modern agriculture. But there's a deeper price. When people are forced to move from the countryside to the towns, both the countryside and the towns are destabilized. The famous favelas of Brazil, the slums of such megatowns as Rio de Janeiro, did not exist before the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution, as you know, was supposed to eradicate hunger throughout the world by applying science to agriculture and thereby increasing output. But change often produces unexpected results. Large, mechanized, scientific farms did produce more food per person directly employed. But those no longer employed were chased into towns creating vast urban concentrations with their tent and slums. As they were uprooted, not only from their homes, but also from their cultures and their families, these refugees and their children were reduced to dependence on welfare and crime. Now, the megatowns and their slums are blamed for the economic and social collapse of whole nations, and we've forgotten that we created them. The GATT proposals would do even greater damage. By preventing nations from protecting their farmers, 
rural communities throughout the world would be washed away as if by a catastrophic flood. Whole populations would be uprooted and swept into urban slums. In the world as a whole, the rural population currently consists of about 3.1 billion people. Let us suppose it is a percentage of total population. It would be reduced to the levels that already exist in the new farming countries like Australia and Canada. The result would be migration from the land to the towns of 2.1 billion people. And these figures will get even worse as population grows. As the affected nations become ungovernable and impoverished, so these people will be forced to seek refuge elsewhere. Mass migration will follow. And do not think that any nation, any, would remain unaffected by vast movements of uprooted and tragic peoples. In our one-dimensional search for growth in GNP, we systematically undermine societies, create unemployment, and then spend our time dealing with the symptoms. Alas, money alone, albeit necessary to alleviate pain, solves no fundamental problems. It deals with symptoms, not causes. As Professor Walter Williams of George Mason University has pointed out, the money spent in the US on poverty programs since the 1960s, and I quote, could have bought the entire assets of the Fortune 500 companies, that's to say the 500 largest companies in America, plus virtually all the US farmland. And what did it do? The problems still remain and they are even worse, end of quote. We all know, in our bones, that we're going in the wrong direction. We also know that the present British government finds fundamental thought difficult. That is why its actions, unintentionally, are often deeply irresponsible. How I wish there were a valid opposition worthy of support. Alas, the present opposition still, still seems unable to shake off decisively the romantic but failed illusions of socialism. Britain is in the unenviable position of having reached the end of an era. Only a few years ago, it seemed that the problems and their solutions were clear. Roll back the state, bring the trade unions under the control of law, allow people to benefit from their work, and let the North Sea produce its riches. All that was absolutely vital. It was right and necessary, and accomplished with extraordinary courage. But as we see today, it was not enough.